So I was really struggling with like, I don't really want to sell the business, right. but the offer was just, this is retirement money. Right. Like I, I could just stop work. Like this is like generational wealth right now. And I'm like, this is more money than I ever planned in my life. This is what people are like work their entire like right. lives to achieve. Uh, I denied their first offer and then they came back with an even stronger. I mean, like when I say stronger, it was uh, three and a half times more than the first offer. What's going on, everybody? Welcome back to a video of, you know, entrepreneurship and real estate investing. I'm actually here with Jonathan. Welcome. Yeah. Um, thanks for really carving out the time. I know you're really busy. We actually just met over the weekend at an event, a real estate uh, event. And uh, he has such a powerful story that I think a lot of people can relate. And I think I wanted to get this content out to, uh, to a lot of folks that may be going through something similar um, or, you know, think that they have to really come from resources or capital to be able to be successful. And um, I just want to hand it over to you so you can talk a little bit about who you are, kind of your background and, um, you know, maybe leading up to what it is that you do or, um, you know, your business that you recently sold. But yeah, I think the most powerful thing is really getting to know where somebody comes from. So I kind of want to start there and who you are. So yeah, so I'll just kind of give you guys a, an idea of like, who I am right now, what I've done, I'll go back to my childhood and what kind of led me up to where, to where I'm at. But um, I I sold my real estate uh, brokerage and vacation rental company here in uh, Destin, Florida uh, last year. Um, sold it to a company called uh, Avant Stay. And um, so sold that. I'm now the, the principal broker for that company across the whole state of Florida. And then I'm also their advisor to the owner of the company, the CEO. Uh, on growth and new operations in the state of Florida. Um, I also have a, another uh, small uh, vacation rental management company in Naples, Florida. Um, I have a title company. Uh, we're in Margo Island, Naples, Fort Myers, Tallahassee in here. Then I have a uh, building construction company, build uh, luxury homes. Um, That's awesome. And a consulting business and a, a lawn care business. Uh, <laughs> Learn what lies in the lawn care business, but yeah, it's a legit lawn care business. And I, I think that's it. Yeah, oh, and then actually the um, the company that bought me out, I now actually own a part of that company as, wow. as well now. Uh, very, very just happened very recently, uh, last few weeks. Um, but, you know, before that, I was actually in the military for, for, for 12 years. So I'm 35 years old right now. And a lot of people are always kind of shocked when they meet me, like with my success. And usually their first thoughts without knowing my background is, oh, this guy must have had a silver spoon in his mouth. You know, right. be a rich kid, mom and dad must have been real estate developers, something, because no one should be able to get to that success of making eight figures by age 35 with, with nothing. Right. And that's why I like to go back to my childhood. So, you know, I was, I was born in Louisiana. Uh, I was raised in, in Southeast Texas, a place called uh, Mauriceville, went to Deweyville High School. And I, I literally was raised in a bar. Um, my, my trailer burned down when I was age 11. And right. then we moved, moved into the barn. Um, I actually lived like in the hayloft. I had no walls. I had a curtain put up. Um, no staircase. Had an extension ladder for my dad's truck that he used for work on the on the ships and oil rigs. That's crazy. And, uh, and that's literally where I stayed until I, I joined the military at age 18. Yeah, I mean, I like to spend a little bit of time, you know, not really just going over that, but just kind of talking of what it was like, you know, what was, you know, or the feelings, emotions, things that you had to deal with as a young kid and as a teenager going through those struggles. Because there's, I think, a lot of people that, you know, go through unfortunate um, situations growing up. And, um, you know, I, I would just like to hear kind of what, what that was like and some of the struggles you had to go through. Yeah. So I, I like to, I like to tell people like, you know, um, you got to find what's going to fuel you. Right. Yeah. And for me, I had anger problems as a kid because I was always getting made fun of, you know, being fat, being poor, whatever it was. So I used that, that hate, I hated being poor. Yeah. I hated being fat, I hated living in a barn. And I would use that as a, as a positive energy. Right. So that was my fuel to doing everything I wanted to do. And I didn't come from a strong family back name. I had no, my name meant nothing. Right. And I, I didn't want to be nothing. 
So I wanted to make a name for myself. And that's how I got, like, at a very early age, I had some guys at my church kind of took me under their wing and started weightlifting. That led to, like, me playing football, things like that, because I wanted to, I wanted to make some name for myself. And, you know, the only thing I could do was, was play sports at that age. Right. So I um, did really good in, in high school sports, and then that also is what led me wanting to go into the military. I was like, this is how I'm going to make who I am, find out who I am. And uh, went into special operations, did that for 12 years. Um, just trying to, you know, I, I guess you could say I had an identity issue. Right. Um, because I didn't know who I was. And I didn't really have, um, a, like I said, I didn't have a strong family name. So I used that, like, basically hate as a way to channel my energy into a positive way. And, and I still use that today and in everything I do with all my businesses. You know, like a lot of people think I would be comfortable with where I'm at financially, but then like I have friends that are like <laughs> way more financially than me, you know, right. 20, $25 million jets, 125 foot yachts. And I'm just <laughs> like, I'm poor. Like I, I hate yeah. that I don't have that. There's just so many levels, right? So many different levels. Like you think you made it and you're like, you meet this guy and you're like, oh, you know, I'm not. Right. So, but yeah, that was kind of like my struggles as a kid, as a, as a young kid, you know, um, I think, you know, one of the things I wanted to highlight and, you know, what you talk about and, you know, uh, a lot of the successful people that I've been around talk about all the time is, you know, let's take a second and talk about the importance of finding the right people in the mentorship, you know, oh, yeah. um, what would you say, you know, how important it's been, you know, the key to your success, you know, one of the keys is, is really finding the right people. How do you think, well, you know, the mentors have played a role in your life up until now? Huge. Um, everything in life, right? Whether it was sports, you know, weightlifting, military careers, um, financial advice, real estate advice, business advice, I I still have a ton of mentors today. Even just mentors on like having a good moral compass, right. which I think doesn't get talked about a lot. But doing the right things, being around good quality lifestyle, yeah, mentors for lifestyle. Um, but you have to be around the people that you that you want to become. If you want to become something, you need to be around that, right? Right. And that's really what it comes down to. If you want to be successful, be around successful people. That's how you're going to gain this knowledge. You're not going to know what questions to ask. You're not going to know what questions to Google. Right. You got to be around the people you want to be. If you want to be a successful real estate agent, be around successful real estate agents. If you want to be a special operator, get around special operators. And mentors have played a huge role in my life. And like I said, they, they still do. I still go to people for advice all the time. I mean, Mentors for taxes, right? Like when I when I sold my business, um, I was facing a massive tax bill. Right. I was like, okay, this is a new one to me. Where do I know how to do this? And I found a, a good person who's kind of specialized in that and saved me. I, I paid zero dollars on the taxes of selling my business because of strong mentors. Um, one of my really good friends, he was actually at the event. Same thing, he had been paying tons of money in taxes every year with his business. And him through me, I put him in contact with my guy. Now he pays nothing in taxes. Literally saves him about three hundred fifty thousand dollars a year. Um, as we always say, let's say Ferrari money. You know. So yeah, I know it's crazy. Would you rather you know give the IRS a, a Ferrari, or do you want to get it for yourself? I mean, exactly. So like, I can't stress enough the mentors. Like mentors, whether it's a mentor, or a coach, something. I, I was telling someone this, um, actually today, I had so many mentors to me that didn't, they didn't even know they were being mentors to me. Right. Like me just always consistently being around them. I talked about that one story. Um, I had, had an old neighbor. He asked me about the World of Warcraft stop. He's like, hey, have you heard of World of Warcraft? And he was just my friend. He was, a, he was an elderly guy. He was a neighbor across the street, very successful guy. He actually sold his uh, health insurance business like in his very early age and made enough money to never work again. And uh, I, I mean, a lot of like private jets, all this stuff. Right. Um, but when he asked me about that and listened to him about stocks and things like that, I was very young. I was probably 25 years old. Right. And this guy is talking about making $150,000 off trading a War of Warcraft stuff. Right. And I'm just like, I'm, I'm making like 50000 a year in the military. Right. And I'm like, what do you mean you, you just made like $150,000? i am like, can you teach me how to do this? And he's probably like, yeah, I just did that in a couple hours. Yeah, so I started picking his brain about stocks, and that's actually how I kind of like started learning about stocks. And this guy had been doing it 
very successfully. I'm like, wow, this is like, I can't believe I never really thought about this or how come no one's talking about right. this? Oh, it's because I don't know anyone that's doing stocks. Yeah. So you have to get around those people. It's just like a lot of times people get around me and then they're like, oh, I want to get some Airbnbs. I want a vacation property. And and they and they do that. So yeah. it's the same thing. Mentors, mentors, men specifically for what it is you want to become. Yeah. And I think that, you know, going into to that topic, the importance of like, you know, we just met over the weekend and going to those events where you're, you know, looking for that next idea, that one thing that might be missing in your business. It might be taxes, it might be, you know, a connection, whatever the case may be. And there's a lot of people that um, don't spend the time and resources to go out there and become better and learn more, right? Like you said, if you want to learn about Airbnbs, you can learn about Airbnbs by going to a conference, going to an yeah. event, finding the right people and finding the right mentors. So, you know, a lot of people, they don't think nothing about spending $200 at a bar, but they won't spend $100 to go to a conference and gain a wealth of knowledge, yeah. right? That, that's something that's always kind of just like- Mind-boggling. Yeah, I'm like, how do you like, don't look at it as an expense. Like you're 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 investing into yourself, yeah. right? Like even me, I, I still pay for like, I wouldn't call them so much mentors as they do coaches. But if there's something specific I need, right. I will hire someone right. because I know their time is valuable. And I'm like, hey, like whatever it costs, I need to gain this knowledge. Yeah. Or if I need to go to a conference and get around like-minded people, or you know, make new networks like how I met with you, right? I'm gonna do it because that money is an investment that's gonna pay itself back in, in the long run. Yeah. So, it, you know, if you don't go out there and put yourself out there, you're never going to grow. Yeah, no. Well, I mean, I had written a couple of questions, that, you know, yeah. that I wanted to go over that make sure that, you know, we don't forget about them. So um, one of the questions I, I, I had was, what's one of your main struggles, um, you know, in this journey and how you overcome it, you know, maybe to where you're at now, something that was, was really challenging at some point or your biggest thing that, you know, you thought, man, this is this is pretty tough. And you overcame it. I would probably almost say, like for for business wise, is is kind of that um, that no name again, right? So, like when I got into the business, I had the background as, as being a special operator, but I had no connections out here. Right. I had you know no family name, and it's kind of hard to break into an industry, especially when like, I mainly focused on like luxury homes for vacation rentals. Right. And it's kind of hard to, to get your foot into the door with those kind of people. Yeah. Especially when you're like, I started off when I was 28 with my business, 29. So, you know, here I am 29 years old and I'm asking people to allow me to manage their $5 million house. Right. It's a lot of trust. Yeah. Like you're 29, you want to, I'm going to hand you my $5 million house. And how long have you been in business? You ran right. business for six months. Yeah. So a lot of people are just like, ah, but my military background is really what, what helped me kind of, they'd be like, Hey, if I didn't, if you didn't have a military background, I wouldn't use you. Right. But it was hard to, it's hard to get established. Mm -hmm. Um, and that's where that grind and that, Hey, I'm waking up every day. I'm going to contact people. I'm going to ask for the business. I might get rejected. And Not did. being afraid of that. No. I actually got rejected. I actually remember. So one of my one of my number one clients, still to this day, um, they're both doctors, married couple. This was like the first, probably two months of my business. Um, I interviewed with them, and they did not pick me up, and I was kind of hurt by that, you know. And then about a year and a half later, I actually got an email from them asking if I would sit down and talk to them. And at first I wanted to be, I was like very prideful. I was like, I don't actually want to because <laughs> I, I felt rejected. Right. right. So I sat down with them and the husband was like, just so you know, I wanted to go with you. It was all her. <laughs> and that made um, you feel a little bit better. Oh, I felt much better. And they, they, they kind of laughed. They're like, hey, look, we thought you were too inexperienced. And we thought if we went with a larger company, it would, it would be better for us financially. And then we found out very quickly, we just became another another number on the books with right. them. And they were like very humble. They were like, we, we seen your growth in the last like year and a half. And they were like, we would love to come back on the program if you would let us. And I was just like, oh, wow. And still to this day, they're, they're a very, very good client of mine. But, you know, that was like one of those, I got rejected. Right. And I'm like, hey, you know what? 
and just got to go to the next one. So that was it was a big hurdle. It's just getting started. Was that property management for them? Their yeah, issue yeah, that was property management for them. And then that actually led eventually to them becoming real estate clients with me as well. Yeah. So buy, sell, and, and manage. Uh, we'll see if we have enough time to kind of break it all down, but I like to kind of go over... You, you know, you had a, a pretty rough, you know, upbringing and, and growing up, you went into the military. How did you end up buying your first property? Let's talk about how you went from basically your first property up until. <laughs> yeah. So I, I just came back from my, my third reenlistment. Um, Appreciate the service, by yeah, the way. Thank you. So, yeah, I did my, I did, did my third reenlistment and I got, I got my bonus and I wanted to be a lot smarter with my bonus this time. And we had, me and my wife had talked about buying a, a condo out here in Destin to, to keep our boat. Right. And so we, had, we had a little house um, outside, outside Destin. So found this condo, um, wasn't really thinking about it as like an investment Airbnb, but I bought that condo very cheap because it was very outdated. I remodeled it uh, mostly myself and made it very, very nice. Um, and then my friend, Eric, who's now one of my agents, um, he had bought the condo below me, uh, specifically for Airbnb rental. So and you had no clue. I that had time. no clue. Even like the first year he was running it, I didn't really think anything of it. Um, actually him and his partner, they would pay me like 50 bucks to go to, like rehang the curtain rods. And then you, you were just like, okay. Yeah, I'm in the military. Military. And he would just text me. He's like, Hey. Uh, the curtain rods down. Could you go like put a screw in it? I'll pay you like fifty bucks. I was like, yeah, fifty yeah, bucks to put a screw. In it. I'm like, yeah, I'll, I'll just walk downstairs and do it. Reset the Wi-Fi router. They, right. they just sent me fifty bucks. I was like, wow, that's kind of cool. But I never, I never really realized what was actually happening. The money they were making right. doing that until that next summer. Uh, me and the wife were, were taking a vacation, and it was actually his business partner. He said, "What are you going to do with your condo when you go overseas?" And this is what I'm saying, like, get around people, right? Yeah. Like, because I never would be where I'm at today if it wasn't for this conversation and, wow. and knowing that. That's insane when you really start bringing it down and it's like this one. I, I never had a game plan. I, it was an accident. And I said, I'm not doing anything with the condo, just going to leave it empty. And this was like in the peak summer, like July here. And he goes, you would make $2,500 a week if you rent that condo. And you're like, what? And I was like, Dude, I said, I'm making $1,000 a week in the military. Like, what, what are you talking about? $2,500. And he goes, trust me, throw it up on VRBO, Airbnb, right. and um, talks to the wife about it. She was at first very, no, we're not doing this. No one's going in our, in our condo. And then she came around to it, and I put it up there for rent. And then three days later, it was booked for six weeks straight, $15,000. Wow. And my mortgage on it for the whole year is like eight. 18 with like HOA dues. So I'm just like, what? Like, I'm just like, like what just happened? Not really. That's what got the wheel spinning. Right. So we actually moved out of that condo, bought another house over here and started renting that condo full time. So the, so the, so the moral of the story is go on vacation, right? <laughs> yeah. Go on vacation. Uh, during the peak season, adjustment for sure. Actually, that's, that's my friend, Eric. That's what he does with his with his personal home. Oh. He rents it for two months a year. And just to get and it, that pays for his vacation. Those two months make him $115,000. Oh. And yeah, it's, it's a very nice house. He, he bought it for $1.9 million. But I mean, he worked his way up to that level. Right. That's the, what you can do. So he's like, hey, I'll make $115,000. And he literally, he travels Europe, he travels Asia, he just goes everywhere with the money. So yeah, that's what got started that property. Um, so we bought another house over here, started renting that condo full time. And then we had our other house that we originally bought that was long-term rental. And so much when you were buying these houses, are you getting traditional financing, putting, you know, yeah, so 10, here's, 15, 20% down? Here's how it happened. So the first house we bought in a bar, um, we bought that with my VA loan. So oh, zero okay. down, wow. you know, it was great. When we bought the condo, we bought it. The wife was active duty, so she we bought it her VA. Oh man, zero down, all that, right? Um. So the house and the, the other house was renting. It was only making like profit four hundred months, nothing crazy. Right. The other house we wind up buying over here, we did have to buy that one conventional. So we bought that one conventional, um, primary like ten percent down, right? And uh, moved into that. Um, so at that point now we're going on a couple of years of tax returns and that's when 
that's how I was able to buy more properties. Because like with my military pay, it, it wasn't good enough to get another mortgage. Right. But once they would add my rental income, I would qualify oh, yeah. another mortgage. So this was at, after that third house we bought, that's when I decided to get my real estate license. And I was like, I'll start buying these properties myself and, and pay myself. So me and my friends uh, combined our money together and we started buying them as investment properties. So we'd buy like the worst looking condos that were on the market for like a year. And we'd go in there, super low offers, got the property, remodel it, turn it to a very nice Airbnb. Um, did that. And we actually, actually, by the time I got out of the military in 2018, I had six Airbnbs wow. going for me. And it was enough to where I'm like, I don't even have to work anymore. I can just right. live off this income. And then that's where the business just grew from there. Wow. Um, you know, let's talk a little bit about, cause you, you know, once you started coming back, you started getting these properties, there were probably maybe some, um, I'm not sure if you want to call it problems or obstacles, issues that started coming up when you started, you know, maybe looking at doing some landscaping, doing some laundry, what, you know, can you talk about what other, uh, you know, businesses, um, or resources, resources started coming up as you started growing? Oh, like additional business right. inside of the around. Yeah. Yeah. So because I'm working the business, I was my first employee, right? Like, right. It's just me and the wife. So I'm housekeeper, I'm the maintenance, I'm the receptionist, I'm, I'm everything. Right. Um, I got to learn my business very, very good. I didn't hire my first employee until I think um, probably a year and a half, almost two years into the business. And I mean, you probably were doing really well even then. I mean, yeah. And that, that first employee, I actually had back. After I got to, I think, eight properties, we hired a cleaning crew um just purely cleaning and then my first employee was a maintenance guy to help me with maintenance right so i had that um I mean, i was still running the business like all hands on deck was me yeah so as i'm realizing like hey why am i paying so much for laundry like right. I'm contracting my laundry out and paying by the pound i'm like this is a crazy amount of money i could save money by literally just buying my own commercial office building and making my own laundry facility and then my housekeepers loved that idea because it gave them more money to wash and fold laundry. And then we didn't have to wait on the contracting for laundry. We didn't have to wait on, you know, or them mixing up linen. Right. They'd always lose our linen. <laughs> and we're like, oh, we have check-in today. Like, this cannot be happening. Right. So bought my own commercial office building, made my own laundry facility. And now I'm literally saving, at that time, I was probably saving myself like sixty. Forty, fifty thousand dollars, something in that area is crazy. So I'm, I'm paying for my facility. Long story short, later on, way later on, I'm actually like now paying myself for roughly probably half a million from the laundry. Uh, wow. I was making that much off of it. Um, then it it led into like uh, gear rental. I used to always like coordinate people renting bicycles from other companies, golf carts, baby cribs, you know, pack and plays. I was like, you know what? I, I got I got money in the business account now. I'll go buy golf carts. Right. So capitalize on that. Yeah. And I would buy the golf carts and I had eight golf carts and they were running for seven hundred dollars each a week. I probably got about nine to ten months a year out of those rentals. So when we do the math, eight times seven hundred, ten months a year, I'm like, this is like why didn't I do this before? Yeah. So I had that going bicycles. I think I was renting them for sixty five each a week. And some of these houses would like big houses, they would rent 15 bicycles. Wow. Um, I always hate to joke about the Jimmy Buffett Margaritaville blender, but <laughs> I kept getting requests from people on Airbnb for a Jimmy Buffett Margaritaville blender. And after I probably heard it 10 times, I think <laughs> I should start putting these in the rent. Right. I think I did them for $75 a week. And these big houses would take like three of them. I couldn't keep them in, like in stock. Everyone would just always rent them. Uh, pack and plays, baby cribs, high chairs. So I found all those other ways to supplement the business. Just adding to, you know, yeah. your, your income. And that's how the lawn care business came into play. Um, my lawn guy made me very upset. And I was like, you know what? I grew up cutting grass in Texas. I was like, I'll start a lawn care business today. And I literally did. I filed my LLC. I went and bought a trailer, went to Home Depot, bought everything I needed. And there was four charms lawn care. And that's yeah. still in business today. And it's a great way to supplement making money. Um, and I'm glad I kind of diversified because it gave me a bunch of options, right? right? 
So even like, you know, like right now, real estate sales, uh, they've slowed down. Right. But I'm like, hey, I have a lawn care business. Right. Adding, putting money in the bank account, things like that. Um, yeah, you have a cash machine. Yeah, it's just, and it, it literally runs itself and it has been for a few years. Uh, I'm trying to think of what else I did to add more business um, in, in, into the business, but that was the major ones was the right. gear rental and laundry facility. That Those were those were huge uh, for, for making a, a significant more amount of money. Awesome. So you're starting all these bit new businesses, you're growing, you know, did you even know at some point you're like, man, I built a, a machine or at what point were you realizing, was it some of those first emails where people were trying to buy you out? At what point were you like, holy smokes, like, or oh, let's talk about a little bit, um, you know, like COVID, right? Yeah. Cause that was probably, you know, for a lot of people, depending on what business you're in that crush your business or that propelled your business. Right. So let's talk about kind of like, yeah, up until then. And then kind of after that, what happened? So 2020 was like the, the first black swan event. And that was like, well, that was like the, the I thought that was going to be my year. Right. Like the start of it. So 2019, 2018 was like our first, like real, real year of business. 2019 we kind of smoothed everything right. out. So we were like, preparing for 2020 we're like all right 2020 is the year and actually it did turn out to be that way but we didn't realize that some <laughs> i think middle of february when we got shut down right like they were like all vacation rentals were stopped and that pretty much stopped all the house sales so i was just like oh wow and i'm like i i don't know what to do and right. i had actually hired um this is actually when i hired my full-time like w2 employee and because he wasn't on the payroll like prior to COVID or like the year before. You I, couldn't get that. Like the, the PPP PPP or yeah, like that. yeah. So I was like, you know what? I will pay you out of pocket myself because mm -hmm. he had just got out of the military. And oh, I was like, man. I can't set this guy up for failure. Right. So I was paying his paycheck out of, out of the business account, which we had some money in there, but I'm like, I don't know how long this is going to last. Right. Um, so we were down for, I think, two, two and a half months. But there was no like, hey, at this time we're gonna start back right out. Probably mindset at that time was just like a lot of people were like, Do we start trying to sell the business? I mean, even though like you said, you couldn't even really sell, but you're just trying to like what I actually got offers to sell the business during that time. Really? Um, I had a company reach out to me and they offered me a half time multiplier, 0.5 multiplier wow. on the business. And they said maybe they could go up to one right. or one point two. I was like what? Like, no, yeah. I'll just, I'll hang on to the business. You're right. crazy. Uh, and it was, it was a really small business at that yeah. time. So we basically, we could, we were allowed to do some rentals if people were coming in for like official business, but not very much. So yeah, it was very nerve wracking. Um, a lot of angry people. Um, homeowners are very angry um, because in this area specifically, we just came out of the winter time. Right. And the winter time, you don't really make any money. The summer makes you enough money to carry you through the winter. Right. So we're coming out of the winter. We're going into spring break where the money is and we can't rent. So people are like, literally like I had to make money. Um, and I felt really bad for my clients that I had just sold a house to. Like I had just closed a house for a client in March and we couldn't rent it. Oh, wow. And I'm just like, oh, this like, is terrible. Yeah. And you can't do nothing. I couldn't nothing, nothing, nothing I could do. Um, and then on top of that, all the, the amount of refunds we had to process, because we were already fully booked, like all the way to like right. September. And it was, it was crazy. And it was probably the first experience of that. Cause you're used to just money coming in all of a sudden you're like, sometimes some of it's paid up front and whatnot. So like the big problem was we had no issue issuing refunds. We would, we would do the refund. No problem. Wait, but there was like the booking fee right. from like Airbnb or VRBO uh, and we can't refund that. Right. And that's from them. And then you got to deal with people trying to get so these people would like call Airbnb and they'd be like, Oh no, it's the host. And they would call us back. And they're like, if you don't give me like that 5% booking fee, I'm going to sue you. And like, I mean, we were, I got death threats. I got all kinds of stuff. Right. Like it's crazy. Just from like, and I'm telling them, I'm like, I'm not lying to you. I really don't have the booking fee. Like you need to contact Airbnb, contact Verbo. Right. And it was, it was very stressful. So luckily it opened up. And then I had never seen the floodgates open up like that. The business, the demand, well, you got to think about it. 
Florida was the only market that was open basically for vacation rentals. Yeah, I remember um, hearing the headlines of like, you know, obviously everybody has different opinions, but people being pissed off. Oh, why is Florida? And I remember everybody was just like focused on Florida because yeah. they were just like, we're, we're good. We're going to open up. We had people coming everywhere. everywhere. Canada, or Canada, California, mm -hmm. New York. Right. I mean, everyone was coming to Florida. So the demand was, there wasn't enough. Right. Uh, we'd have people on wait lists, but the business was just growing. So I should say during that COVID time, a bunch of management companies here went bankrupt. Um, so they lost. We started acquiring our customers and we couldn't keep up with the demand. Um, I went from about, I think I had 27 or 28 properties under rent. And by the end of that year, I had almost 80. And, that, and I didn't barely hold on to that. I, right. I was actually denying, I was probably turning away 10 to 15 houses a month to manage. Wow. I couldn't keep up right. with demand. And then our sales, sales went crazy. I should also say 2020 was when I launched the real estate brokerage with the management company. So there's so, so much just poof, Yeah, just, so I, I launched the, you know, the sales brokerage in January and then it's like shut down. I'm like, I'm like of course, you know, this is, how, yeah. this is my luck. Um, but then the agents started growing. I think I ended up at the end of that year, I think about 15 real estate agents in the right. brokerage and our sales were just, were going crazy. Um, so 2020 was a really good year. Um, actually that was the first time I like, I like actually legitimately, legitimately made, uh, seven figures. I didn't even right. know it until the end of the year until we did like the accounting. Right. And I was like, oh my God, like we actually, I can't, I was just like, I'm yeah. shocked. Right. But. At the end of that year, I actually started getting offers from companies, um, not bad offers, but there was, I was like, I'm not interested. Like I'm just getting started. Right. Um, and then 2021 was the best year um, right. we, we ever did. Uh, the business, it, it grew crazy. Rates were really low. Everybody's like, man, let me get a, a vacation rental. You're yeah. probably just making money from property management, adding clients that way, mm -hmm. but you know, people that wanted to buy. So that was a big thing. Like. Because even in 2021, most places were still shut down for COVID. Um, so people would come stay at the vacation rental and then they would wind up just buying one right. to stay there. They're like, you know what? We're just going to stay here. And they would do it. Um, so I remember by March of 2021, we had already done in sales that January, February, what we did for the entire year of 2020. And it's crazy. Um, oh, it, it was nuts. And then on property management, I think our rates actually went up about 30% from the year before because the demand was just that crazy. Yeah. Um, so we, the business skyrocketed. Oh, it, 2020 it, it was literally just, just every quarter it would double. So like by the second quarter of 2021, like we had already done literally double the sales, what we had did for 2021 <laughs> already. Like it was just, it was that nuts. Yeah. I was personally probably closing five to seven houses a month myself. Um, and then with all the agents, we were probably closing 20 ish houses. A well, month. What did your life look like at that point? Like as far as how many, how many hours were you and your wife putting in the business? Like, you know, I oh. imagine it was pretty nuts. You know, I couldn't even, I couldn't even enjoy my money. Right. I, I had no time to spend it. And not that I was even looking to spend it. I was like, this is the grind. I'm going to get it while I can get and it. And you knew the opportunity was right there. It's like, yeah. right now is a moment. So I, and there was no vacations. There was no weekend trips. There was no time off. There was no fancy, you know, excursions and cars. It was literally every, I would grind. I, I, I usually wake up about four in the morning. I was literally already working. Um, I was working with overseas clients as well. Like I, I had a guy uh, from Japan who bought a house over here cash. Um, I had clients around the world. It's like, whenever I would wake up, people would be awake. Yeah. I'd be messaging them, letting them know. I would tell people, hey, I wake up at like four in the morning. I would literally work till 10, 30, 11 o'clock at night, sometimes even later. Probably people, you probably just got business from people like, I want to work with that guy. He yeah. was up at four or 5 a.m. every day. A lot right. of people wanted to work with me um, because I wasn't just the sales guy. Like I was the management company. So I could intelligently speak about everything, vacation, right. rental. I wasn't like, hey, let me sell you this house. I'll hand you off to a management company. Right. Then you deal with them. I'm not sure. Yeah. What. So it was a nice revolving door. Also, one reason why the sales were just kept doubling was because the market value right. was, was skyrocketing. So the house I sold in 2020, I'm now selling again in 2021 and then selling them another house. Right. And then we're selling the house again in 2022. 
So it was just like this massive revolving door uh, of business. Like I had one client, three house sales, uh, $7 million, you know, with, with three house sales. Yeah. And it was just vacation, sell this vacation rental, give another vacation rental, give another vacation rental. Yeah. And we just kept going like that. So yeah, 2021 was the best year ever. Um, I still did not intend to sell the business. I, we were, I had the whole game plan set for 2022. 2022, I was like, this is the year. Right. We had it all set. I had all the little, every, now everything's perfectly smoothed out. I had right. the right team with me on the broker side. I had the right team with me on the management side. Lawn care is doing good. Gear rental is doing good. Um, everything was set perfect. And I'm glad I had it set that way because that's actually what allowed me to sell the business. Um, 2022 came around. Um, I was also doing business in Naples on back and back forth. And forth. Yeah. Had my pilot's license, been wanting to buy a plane. Now I mean, I needed a tax write off. Right. <laughs> so I'm in Vegas. I, I I'm, I'm buying a plane and, uh, I'm doing my, my training to get my rating for right. that, for that aircraft. I get a phone call from um, a salesperson. And they're like, we're, we're looking to expand in the Dustin area. We found your company. We interviewed a bunch of other ones. We think you're the right fit um, because your brokerage is specifically focused on vacation rentals. And that's what we do. And we would like to take a look at your financial statements to see if, you know, if your company is healthy. Right. And so I get it with my CPA. Three days later, I'm, I'm still in Vegas doing my training. I, I get an offer, and I was just like, like, "Oh, like I'm like, this is a serious offer." Right. And this was a good offer because most of the offers I got, they would basically dismantle the whole company. Right. All the employees are fired. Right. And they just they take over the portfolio, raise rates, and that's it. I didn't want to do that because right. I always tell people like I don't network. I, I I make relationships. Yeah. So everyone I had in the management program. I had a relationship with whether I was in the military with them, they were friends of military. So I was really struggling with like, I don't really want to sell the business, right. but the offer was just, you know, like this is some real money. Yeah. Like this, this is like, like this is retirement. Money. Right. Like I, I could just stop work. Like this is like generational wealth right now. This is life changing. And, and I'm like, this is more money than I ever planned in my life. Um, like when I got out of the military, my goal was to make a hundred K a year. Yeah. And I'm just like, like this is just this is not this is wild. This is wild, wild. Like I could just like it, like this is what people are like work their entire like right. lives to achieve. So I I really thought about it a lot. Um, uh, I denied their first offer, and then they came back with an even stronger. I mean, like when I say stronger, it was uh, three and a half times more than the first offer, and I was just like. Like, I was just like, and they, they told me straight up, they're like, look, we really, they really want to buy your company. We interviewed a lot of companies. This is the right fit for what we want. So this is like our best and final offer. They're like, we normally don't pay this much. Um, and that's actually true because my CPA, when I sold it, he asked me, he goes, how did you get so much money for your company? He goes, I've done the other acquisitions. The other companies are bigger than you. He actually says, you're not worth this now. Right. And I was just like, <laughs> mean, Luke. I was like, that's real mean. But I was just like, I don't know. I guess I'm a good negotiator. But yes, yeah, so they they made a, a a ridiculous, like very good, good offer. And I was like, okay, I'll take it. And it was, I mean, the best decision I ever did in my life. Yeah, I was gonna say, well, I can just imagine what was the, you know, thoughts, emotions between you and your wife going through, like, oh, like back and forth, like you know, because I know it's probably tough for both of you guys. Like, so I remember. It, it was, and I'll tell you, I think I was kind of stuck on was, um, I love Shark Tank, right? <laughs> yeah. I love watching. We were watching it last night with my wife. I, I watched, I've watched every episode since the stage. Yeah. And it was kind of messing with me. Cause there's um, a fine line, right? It's like when people go sometimes. Well, Mark Cuban said he got offered to sell his company, I think for like a million dollars the first time. Right. And he was actually considering like doing it. And then he decided not to do it. And I think he said maybe two years later, he sold the company for like, I don't know, 50 million or a hundred million. Yeah. So that was kind of in my head. I'm yeah. Like, Please, dude, I'm like, this is an amazing offer, but I'm like, what if I could make this company a hundred million dollar company, a true hundred million dollar company yeah. 
And then I was starting to think, I'm like, am I just being like, is that my ego getting in the way and I'm being yeah. stupid? Because like I already built this company up to pass well, I mean, it was well past eight figures in the yeah. company. And I was like, I think I just like, like this is such a good offer. Like take this money and I can do more with it. Right. And then the vacation rental industry business is, it's busy. It's yeah. very busy. So me and the wife never had time to do to do anything. Yeah. So we, we talked about it um, over that night. And um, she was like, you know what? I mean, it, it was, so Avant Day is owned by, by Marriott Hotels. Mm -hmm. This is Marriott yeah. Money. Yeah. And I'm like, I feel like I'm an idiot if I turn down Marriott Money. Like, right. this is like. But, like, yeah, I mean, it's just the ultimate goal. It's like the best you can possibly get scenario when you start thinking about it, right? And that's that's how we kind of thought about it. I was just like, yeah, we're crazy if we turn this down. So I was like, you know what? We'll take it. We did it. Closed the business out. It was a very fast close. Um, it was actually about a month and a half. Wow. Um, it was very, very fast. They, they bought it. And so we were able to close it that quick and get the offer that quick because our books by our CPA. Yeah, I was gonna talk about that. I um, think that yeah, how that. important was that, you know, one of the one of the topics on stage over the weekend was like, you gotta have the right people working with you and those people will make or break your business. And I think it's mind boggling, you know, the amount of money you transacted in a short amount of time. But I was, you know, thinking, I was like, how is that possible? Cause they do a lot of due diligence. So I'm like, okay. he had his stuff together, Yeah, you know? So I. So basically from when I built and sold the business was four years, right? And in four years, I grew the, the company to 61 million. Uh, I would say from 60,000 to 61 million, because that's what we did our first year. It was a few months of, of 2017 right. and we made 60K and then at the end of 2021, it was 61 million. <laughs> that's you know, I know that, that's how, uh, that's why COVID was actually a really good thing for right. business. So, um, but they told me, um, they told me during the, during the transaction, all that, so after they looked at my financials of the CPA, I got the offer in three days. And they said they'd never done it that quick, but that's not because of how organized I was at my financials, it's because I hired someone that was very good. Right. And my CPA was um, uh, Luke Smith's amazing guy. He specifically does vacation rentals. Shout right? out to Luke Smith. Yeah, right. like, so vacation rentals and real estate is what he does. He knows how to keep it organized. I actually had to do a Florida Department of Revenue audit and if it wasn't for him, wow, it would it would have been crazy. So having having quality people, right? Yeah, and I think people overlook that. It's just like you know, for me, like I'm Hispanic. We grew up in a Hispanic community, and all the time, one of the things I talk about is our community is always like, "Hey, you need to get your taxes done. Go see your 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 yeah. cousin, your uncle down the road. He's right over there next to the gas station." You know, and it's like, no, find the person that is yes. the professional and specialist in that field exactly and i think i said this on stage but my my biggest regret my first two years of my biggest regret in business was my first two years i didn't hire a cpa i was like oh i'll just do this myself i'll get on quickbook right you know i'll do my turbo tax and and file it i was all jacked up yeah um because i was trying to be cheap i was trying to save like 200 dollars a month cpas were really not that expensive right. i was trying to save a few hundred bucks and not realizing the bigger picture my CPA makes me makes me millions because he makes me avoid taxes. He right. keeps me in good order. So if I didn't have him, my books would not have been in good order. And that's actually like the number one reason why companies like uh, this company that bought me out, they walk away from acquisitions. And they find a company, oh, this is a good company. And then once they see how messed up the books are, numbers aren't lined up, they think your company has either maybe no integrity, maybe mm -hmm. you're hiding stuff. Or they're like, hey, if the books are messed up, everything you're, else, you're, uh, the rest of your business has to be messed right. up. So that's usually like why a lot of companies, the acquisitions get get canceled wow. um, because they're just not good. Um, but since my company was good, offer came in very quick. We were able to close it very quick. They were able to, their CPAs were able to work with my CPA. Um, and then also, um, shout out to my wife, but she kept all of our rental software in such good organization with all of our homes, um, like the revenue reports of over all the years, our, our future bookings, um, which was huge because the future bookings also played into the into the offer as well. So they look at, you know, okay, what did you do the last two years of business? And then what is the company on track for for this year? Projection, yeah. 
So that was a having that very well organized where she can just go in there and be like, oh yeah, here's a file. Bring it all down. Good to go. Let's so go. yeah, we were one of the, also another big thing was um, we didn't have too many hands in the jar. The whole business was me and the wife as the owners. We didn't have 10, 20 plus owners. Yeah. So the acquisition was was done very easy. Um, and when I said, when they do acquisition, it it is, I was literally doing like Zoom calls at, um, because they were a West Coast time. I'd be doing them till like almost midnight with their with their staff. Oh, yeah. Because it was just questions over everything. I mean, they want personalities of homeowners. I mean, everything. So because I ran the business myself, I was able to answer all Yeah, you knew everything. You knew it. Or when they would say, what is this line item? What is this charge? What is this? Me and the wife are right there. Hey, we can answer that. Mm-hmm. Um, so knowing the business was, was huge. And that's why they actually wanted to bring, bring me on with the company. I wasn't just like... You, you were so involved. You knew exactly what was going on yeah. with everything. So that, it, was a, it was a huge part. But yeah, you, if you're going to be a business owner, you have to be organized. I mean, it just... It's a reflection of you. Yeah. You know, so, yeah. No, that's awesome. Um, yeah. So you now, you know, get that huge acquisition. I'm sure, like you said, it was just like life-changing money, you know, retirement. Just so one of the questions that I hadn't written down is, you know, can you tell me a little bit about, you know, how, um, you know, how uh, coming up to this point, um, any struggles in adjusting to your success, what brings financial, personal, socially impact, essentially everything, how do you manage it? You know, like, cause I know, you know, there's so many different levels, like you said, you know, oh, I just can, I, I wanna get to $100,000 a year, right? Mm-hmm. And then you get to 200, 300, there's different levels, right? And in every single one of those levels, I think there's certain, you know, struggles or things that we have to go through, right? Um, we were talking briefly over the weekend at some of those things with, Socially, right? Mm -hmm. Uh, Financially, it's just kind of like maybe even talking about your first sports car. You know, you're probably like feeling guilty. I know, should I buy it? Should I not? Like, I I remember thinking that on like first sports car, right? So I'm I'm very smart with my money. And um, like the money I made from the selling business, I reinvested most of it, right? right? So most of it went right back into real estate. Make it a key work. Yeah. Put it to work. I own a lot. I own a lot of the land that um, 7-Elevens are leased on. So like I own the land and people that want to open up like a 7-Eleven, they lease it for me. And that pays me distributions, right? Because I want to make sure I don't blow my money right. to go broke. I have to have other right. assets paying money. And then the home building um, ties up a lot of my money because the homes I'm building are one home with land cost and build cost is um, $2.8 million, right? The other home I'm building is $2.2 million. And I'm paying that all cash, no, no right. financing. So it ties up my money in a good way that will pretty much, you know, good assets. About a about a forty to sixty percent return on on each house. Um, so I wanted to make sure I was smart with the money I made, um, but you know I wanted to have a little bit of fun with right. it as well. Plus we already had money that we had made like in 2020, 2021. Right. And we never actually got to to spend. Yeah, from all the cash flow. So uh, I, I remember like when I bought my first Lamborghini. Um, so story behind that was when I was in the military, I went to Italy and then I, I rented a Lamborghini at the, it was a Lamborghini rental place across from the Lamborghini factory. I drove an Aventador. It was a, it was yeah. a 2014 Aventador. Wow. And I was like, I could not stop smiling, right? Yeah. Like that V12, and I'd never experienced something like that. That was the last time I ever drove like a, a fancy sports car like right. that until I bought mine. Um, so I remember we walked in the dealership, my friend's dealership down in Benita Springs. And um, my wife said, I really like that car. And we had popped in this dealership for the last year, but never bought anything. Right. And she's like, do you want to get it? This is a week before the business actually closed. And I had the money to buy it. Right. I was still like, I was like, you know what? I'm like, I think I should just go buy a house. Right. As a rental property. Because it was it was the cost of a house. And uh, I, she was like, Hey, we've been making all this money. Like, are we just going to keep buying house after house after house? She's like, at what point do you enjoy? have enough properties? Right. And uh, she's like, let's enjoy it a little bit. And I, I kind of thought about it. And I was just like, and I, so I bought it, but I actually felt like like guilty about it, right? Yeah. Like, I didn't want to. Sh- I didn't. I didn't post it on Instagram. I didn't post it on Facebook. I didn't want to tell people like I bought it. Like, although it made me so happy driving it, right? And hearing it, like I, I loved it. But like also like coming from where I come from, like 
people don't have that kind of like not even close. And this is right. we're talking like maybe six, seven years of, of working. Like, right. My dad makes thirty eight thousand dollars a year. Right. And uh so I'm just like, I I shouldn't post this. I shouldn't like, you know, I shouldn't do this. And I, I did it for a very, very, very long time. But you know what? I I, I regret that because I didn't realize that was my ego not wanting to feel that way right yeah and really we should be inspiring others with our, right. with our wins right hey like it wasn't like my dad handed me a lamborghini right like i came from people know where i come from right like it's more of an inspiration so yeah. now i like to show my wins i like to hey yeah here's my cars here's here's my lifestyle here's what's possible and yeah. and it's I've had so many people, they're just like, man, like, I don't know who you are. I see you. Like, I'm a young, I'm a military guy. Like, I want to be like you. Like, can I keep in contact with you? I'm like, yeah, absolutely. You know, like, I'm not show, I'm not shoving it in your face. I'm just saying, like, man, this is what's possible with yeah. hard work yeah. and, and getting after it and grinding every day. And so, yeah, now I, I love to showcase my wins. Yeah. But I had some people get very upset with me uh, by doing that. And yeah. the people that got upset with me were some of my, like, I thought they were close friends, right? But when I actually started reflecting on it, I'm like, how close were they really? Right. They were just kind of more hanging around, just trying to like yeah. leech on. Yeah. And some of them didn't like that I was posting because I, I had a, I had a Lamborghini, and a Ferrari, I had a Chevelle, I had a '67 Cobra, I had a '392 Jeep, I had a, just a Ram 25 right. a Maserati SUV, wow. and it's all there in my garage. Yeah. And I was never posting it. Yeah. And then I'm taking my plane, I'm flying back and forth everywhere. And when I did post it, some of them got so mad about it. Yeah. Like that I was like, oh, you're just bragging, throwing around man's penis yeah. faces. And I'm like, I work for this stuff. Yeah. This is mine. If you don't like it, unfollow. You know what? You know what I'm not doing that you're doing? I'm not going to the bar every weekend. Yeah. I'm not spending three, four hundred dollars on weekend drinking beer. Yeah. Like I'm actually showing my wins. Right. And I got rid of all that toxic, yeah. got the fat, and best thing I ever did. But yeah, I just wish I would have showcased my wins a lot earlier to inspire a lot of people more. Yeah, I know. Well, I mean, uh, congratulations. I mean, it's just such an amazing story. I'm sure there's so many people that are going to watch this video and and being able to connect with you and 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 reflect and like you said, get inspired. You know, and seeing what's possible. You know, I mean. Uh, there's just so many stories out there. And like you said, sometimes it takes a long time for you to mentally, like you said, whether it's mental, ego, just like feeling bad, but it's good. You know, I mean, it's, I tell my wife all the time, like, you know, it's not bragging. You're just showing people what's possible yeah. and giving people the opportunity um, to be able to, to do the same thing. And knowing that, you know, that if I can do it, if you can do it, we can do it. You know, um, it's not like, you know, come from a different planet. <laughs> it's not like I'm saying, like, oh, look how much better I am than you, right? right? Like, I had one thing, uh, second order effect of having like a Lamborghini is like when I go places and I get out of my car and people look at me and they're like, we're the same age, maybe, or maybe it's a young right. person, whatever. They'll just come up to you and start talking to you. And they're yeah. like, hey, like, hey, man, what do you do for a living? Right. You know, and I tell them, like, hey, you know, I'm, I'm a former military guy, I do real estate businesses. And they're just like, they're they're curious they want to know right. and it, it'll inspire them like yeah i love it when like young kids come up to me and they're like hey like you know what do you do for a living blah blah like and i just tell them like do this do this do this i give them like really good advice and they're just like thank you so much and i you know so it, in a way it attracts people that want to get help me right want to become better and I, I i love doing that like usually when i go to the gas station i usually have a little kid get in my car they're like hey can you take a photo with it i'm like no get them in the car seat like, I'm like, get me yeah. in there. Like, so I'm like, no, get in the driver's seat, take a photo. That's all. Like, I love doing stuff like that. Like, I wish I had that when I was a kid. I wish someone was like, hey, get my Lamborghini and take a photo. Like, I would have been like, yeah, no, know. I mean, that's 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 awesome. It just kind of shows what kind of person you are, you know? Yeah. Um, one thing I wanted to ask you is, uh, what do you think is the one thing that separates you from a lot of your friends or a lot of the people that, you know, has probably made the biggest impact and, and maybe gotten to your success? Like, what would you say is maybe like your superpower your genius zone something that you know that like man uh, i can do this really well that separate separate me from most people yeah it, it was the guts to try um really it's just the guts to try it wasn't because like i was smarter than people there's way smarter people than me yeah but a lot of times very very smart people 
they won't take risk. Yeah. Right. They don't, they're too afraid. A lot of people are, a lot of people's egos get in the way. Yeah. They don't want to fail at something. So for me, it was just the guts to try. Like I was never the, I was never the best. Like even like in special operations, like trying out, I was never the fastest, the strongest. I just had the guts to actually show up and put myself out there. I'm like, hey, if I fail, I fail. If I make it, I make it. Right. Same with business. I'm like, hey, I'm going to give it everything I got because you know what? All, all, uh, all, uh, all, uh, all that is at home is a red barn. Yeah. <laughs> Like I can't, I can't really go backwards. I got nothing to lose. Yeah, I'm already, I'm already at the bottom. Might as well just go up from there. Um, so yeah, it's, it's just it's just guts and try. Yeah, no, yeah. I mean, you know, there's a lot of people that live in fear, and they're just like, you know, well, what if this happens? What if that happens? And it's like, start thinking, programming your mind to like, what if the opposite happens? What if it works? I mean, people always ask. I've been hearing this. I heard this like back in 2017, 2016, 2015. People are like. When's is now a good time to buy real estate? You know, they're always like, no, right. I, I think the market's going to crash. I've been here since 2015. The market was going to crash. And you can't win if you don't play, right? Yeah. Like your money can't grow if it's sitting on the sideline. Yeah. And that's what I always tell people. I'm like, look, I didn't know if the market was going to crash back then. People were telling me, it was gonna, my own broker was telling me it was going to crash. Right. 2017. Yeah. Now I'm buying up all this property. I'm glad I didn't listen yeah. because that's how I made my money. I bought these properties at a, at a way different time where they were cheaper. Um, but like, if you don't, no risk, no reward, yeah. right? Like you just have to go out there and take the risk. Yeah. And, and I'm, I don't consider myself, a, I, I consider myself a very educated risk taker. Uh, one thing I didn't talk about, but like when I was buying all these Airbnb properties, I didn't have the money to remodel them. I was maxing my credit cards out as a staff sergeant in the military. So I was literally maxing my credit cards out because I was remodeling them in the winter. But I knew once spring break came that March, I would make enough money to pay those right. credit cards off. So those are smart, educated risks. Very educated risks. But like, you know, like just like November, December, January, February, like, oh man, these credit cards are racking up. I'm, right. I'm racking up like $40,000 in credit cards. My salary is like $50,000. Yeah. So it was a very educated risk. And then by May, credit cards are paid. Yeah. So you have to take those risks, but I know a lot of people, um, I saw this a lot over the years. If the plan wasn't a perfect like Excel spreadsheet for a rental property, they wouldn't buy it. Yeah. Or they're making that perfect plan and they miss out on the house Yeah, and they just keep missing out on houses, missing out on houses. And then like years later, they're like, oh man, I wish I would've got the house because now it's worth $2 million right. or something like that. See? You just got to take a little little risk. Yeah, you, got, yeah, you got to play the game. We see it all the time when so many people are just the same thing. It's like, oh, when everything aligns, I'm ready to buy. You know, and it's like for so long, people were just like, oh, man, I'm just waiting for the market crash. And, you know, you got all these people talking. And it's like, okay, well, the market's starting to correct. There's opportunities out there. Like, are you ready? And it's like, oh, well, no, I'm not buying now because ain't nobody buying. But one thing that we were talking about recently is like, there's going to be a massive opportunity. And, you know, I think, as you said, I think one of the smartest decisions probably you'll say, like selling that business at that time, oh, yeah. talk about timing. And now you're capitalized on the next phase of opportunities that are just around the corner. I know one thing we're talking about, there is a lot of, a lot of, a lot of things going on in real estate, you know, multifamily, commercial. One thing that we talked about over the weekend that a lot of people aren't talking about, there's a huge issue with insurance. Oh, yeah. Right? Uh, Especially like in Florida. Right. Florida's a massive insurance problem. So there's people right now that have are holding multifamily that now that they have to renew their insurance, yeah. it's not going to cash flow. No. They got I've seen that. Um, I, I saw a friend here in Florida. He does multifamily around the nation. And uh, I could be wrong on exactly how it was said, but I thought it was said his insurance went up like, Fifteen thousand dollars per apartment, or something like that, on the complex. Yeah. Now it's not cash flow. It's just like, oh, yeah, that's insane. And it's partly true. I mean, I know one thing you were talking about is, um, you know, there was that huge article in in, in new, on the news about, you know, that condominium or whatever that complex that that collapsed, that collapsed, and that yeah. um, and what that did is put a lot of insurance companies and HOAs and all these people on alert. And it's like, wait a minute. I'm insuring so many, like, let's go back and yeah. start looking at analyzing. And there's a lot of people now that are in a bit tough spot. Yeah, no, that, that's happening here in Destin. So um, that, that condo collapsed in Miami, I think it was about two years ago. And because of that, the state is now inspecting all condominium buildings. And a lot of these condos are old, right? 70s, 80s. 
and th- and they've been getting like battered by hurricanes. Right. Um, so a lot of them were finding out here now they have these massive structural issues and like they're assessing six figure assessments on these, on these condominium owners, um, to make it right. So yeah, there's a, there's a lot of stuff like that happening right now where a lot of people are like, I don't have $150,000 for an assessment. Right. And then either it gets taken back by the HOA liens, wow. stuff like that. It's a lot of stuff going on. Um, yeah, we'll, we'll go ahead and start wrapping up this this interview, but I, I appreciate it. Um, I just want to ask you one one more question, and then you know if you can leave the audience with uh, you know anything that you feel will be you know insightful or helpful. One of the last things is: is there maybe a question that maybe you're surprised or you wish that more people would ask? You know, because I know a lot of people ask a lot of the same questions, right? Mm-hmm. But maybe is there a question that you feel like you're surprised or you would think or wish that more people asked about your particular journey or where you're at? Hmm. You know, I almost want to say like, man, that sounds kind of crazy, but I almost want to say like, like integrity in, in a way, like kind of how, more so than just like business advice, but being so being honest and in, in, in the business, like having integrity when things go wrong is what literally made my business excel. And I kind of talked about this a little bit, but yeah, whenever there was a bad situation, right? Well, I'll give you a great example. I knew another management company that would get the property booked, but they would open up the calendar to the homeowner. So they don't see the reservation and they would pocket that money for that booking. Oh, wow. Right? And I remember hearing about that from, from that individual. And I was like, I cannot believe you're doing that. Like literally it's criminal. Right. And he's like, oh, it's like everybody does this. He's like, everyone does this. This is how you make this is how you make money. You know? And I was just I was so shocked to hear that, right? So like I wish people would talk more about like integrity right. in business. Yeah. Because uh, unfortunately, you probably see this, but I, I don't see a lot of integrity in the real estate industry. Yeah. Uh, a lot of people are just looking for quick cash. Yeah. So a big thing with me was always doing the right thing, even though there was times I knew I could cover something up. Right. Like, let's say my we damaged a home. Right. I could easily just cover this up and, and get away right. with it and not eat that bill. But I would always do that. And I didn't even realize what I was doing by being, by having integrity, but I was building lifelong relationships. And that's why my clients never left. Um, I don't think I ever, honestly, ever had a client leave my management company. Wow. Um, that's crazy. I mean, when you think about probably, you know, how many oh, people switch. Most yeah. management companies have very high turnover rate. Um, and I don't, most of my, I don't think I ever had a client leave the company. I fired some clients because they right. were they were crazy. Um, like they would hack the thermostat on the home right. renters and stuff like that. But I don't think I ever had a client leave. And I'll tell you what the integrity did though. So whenever there was a bad situation, even with like a renter, something get messed up, they're mad. They're at the point where like, I'm going to sue you for this. And I'm like, whoa, 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 whoa. Hey, I'm yeah. sorry. We're, we're going to eat that bill for you. Yeah. Don't worry about it. And I would eat that thousand dollar, two thousand dollar bill. Maybe I maybe I double booked a reservation and it cost me five thousand dollars. I would eat that five thousand dollars. But what that does is well, now the now the person's happy. That's what yeah. they want. They want to be heard. They right. want to be fixed. But they know, hey, I saw John in a bad situation, and he's going to do the right thing in the bad situation, and we build that trust instantly. So I didn't have to work on trust for three to four years of good times. You get that validation right there in the bad times. So I, I instantly made like a, tr- a lifelong client but, that way. And, uh, and I always got so much business from them. They'd always talk so positive about me. So I kind of wish people would talk more about like just the integrity side yeah. of being a businessman because there's a lot of companies out here that don't have integrity and you see the business is not doing very well, yeah. but that was literally what excelled me. That's actually what excelled me in just the community. Um, like referrals. Yeah. So referrals is a huge, how I grew my business. Um, integrity again, right? I would never steal other realtors clients. So realtors are usually very like, Oh, I don't really want to send them to that management company because they're also a real estate brokerage. Because right. they're they're feeling like, hey, what if they try to steal my client? Right. And this would always come up. So they're I'm working with their client on a daily. 
And then they'd be like, hey, are there any good investment properties out there I could buy? And I'm like, oh yeah, there's a few good ones. And they'd be like, hey, if you don't mind, send them over to me. And you know, like, oh, can I work with you? Right. And I'd always say no. And I could easily take that client. Right. And I'm refusing like $100,000 commissions. These are big houses. And I'm like, hey, you know what? No, you had to go back to your realtor. Like, I, I will send your realtor these properties that I know are good vacation rental properties, but you have to go back and use your realtor. And they'd be like, oh, okay, yeah, sorry about that. You know, I didn't know how it worked. And I'm like, yeah, no big deal. And, and or I'd always talk to the realtors that brought me their clients. I'm like, hey, just to let you know, if like your current. client's looking to buy something, I'm going to send you some good properties that have good numbers. This is what you want to sell them. So by doing that, yes, I lost a ton of money in commissions, but I really didn't. I made a ton of new business and I never had that reputation of like, oh, don't send them to like four charms. They'll steal your renters or still your buyers right. because there's a lot of companies out here that would do that. There was actually a lot of shady companies out here that would uh, put in their management contracts. If you're going to sell the house, you have to use their real estate oh, brokerage wow. and they, the customer didn't, didn't even know it. Yeah. So things like that. I just wish more people would, would ask questions like that. Good little compass. Yeah. Um, doing the right thing because I think a lot of times it gets, it gets overlooked, but that'd be my biggest advice to the audience as well. Like I'm telling you, even when you're facing a financial situation where you're like, I can just lie and get out of this. Think about what that does to your soul, what it does to your mindset. Like stay true to yourself. Don't lie. Keep it integrity. I'm telling you, like the good vibes, energy, God, and all that. I mean, it'll, karma's real. Yeah. Karma's real. Do the yeah. right thing and you, and you get there. Yeah, I know. I mean, I agree with that. I mean, I'm sure we've all seen it, you know, how, how it can go down and happens to people that are just like, you know, I have short-term thinking. Find me on Instagram, um, jonathan.howard.17. Um, find me on Facebook as well. Um, Instagram, I'm, I'm definitely a little more active on with the messages right. and stuff. So, like, send me a message. I'll, I'll get it. I'll see it. Or or comment, and then I'll see it, and I'll, I'll add you as a friend and, and follow you back and talk to you. But, you know, I, I was saying, like, everyone's on their own path. A lot of people yeah. are, are very new to real estate industry, and if I can just help them get a little jump start, um, happy to help you out and you know i want to see you blaze your own trail in, in your journey and watch you grow as well uh, the same way i have because i always tell people this but like i never got to where i'm at because i'm a smart guy but i was smart enough to listen to the people that were smarter than me yeah and take little bits of pieces of advice from so many different mentors and, and, and coaches and then apply it to myself and then find my, my journey that way yeah, that's awesome. You know, that's something that, you know, that was a common thing over the weekend. It's just that go-giver mentality. I'm the exact same way. Um, I've, I've actually written, uh, read that book, The Go-Giver. I love that book. And it's just always about um, giving without expecting. Mm -hmm. And things are always going to happen. You know, you're going to have a good relationship. Opportunities are going to come your way. But just doing the right thing and being a go-giver. So um, I definitely appreciate, uh, I know you're real busy with your brokerage and what you have going on. The last thing before we close this out, I did want to ask is, um, now what does your lifestyle look like and where do you see yourself in the next five years? Where do you think, you know, you'd like to be five years from now? Um, what kind of things would you like to be doing and um, where do you see yourself? Yeah, I can tell you, I, I can tell you, I got a two year plan, you know, okay. two year plan. Um, but the, the two year plan is I, <laughs> I'd actually like to get to uh $50 million is, is where I want to be like, just like in, in personal like assets and right. finances and stuff like that. So I want to, I want to be to $50 million there. Um, and, and growing with what I, what I got from right. now. Um, so financial wise, that's where I want to be with, with the businesses and then continue growing just the businesses I, I have currently, um, is, is a big yeah. plan, but the lifestyle I have now is definitely, um, it's more time for me and the wife. Right. Yeah. So like we were both active duty for pre, you know, our twenties Yeah. and we missed out a lot on that. And then, you know, halfway through our thirties, we were just working that business. So we're definitely more cautious with our time. Yeah. Uh, we're also planning on like having kids here probably awesome. soon. So we're, we're trying to get everything set up to where we, we can raise our kids ourselves. Um, yeah. like I don't want to just put them in daycare all day. Yeah. I want to be there and raise my kids. So that's awesome. I'm definitely more, much smarter with my time, how I give my time, um, especially like for, for business. Yeah. Um, I just work smarter. Um, I don't have to go out there and just like patch every hole in the drywall. Yeah. Now. Like I just, yeah. I'm a lot smarter with my time, but yeah, that's, that's my, that's my two year plan. Awesome. 
Well, thank you so much. I mean, uh, you know, I'm sure you guys will have a beautiful family, and I can tell you one of the biggest blessings uh, for our family has been being able to do that. You know, we have a son. He's uh, nine years old. You know, they've been enjoying the beach for the last week while I've been at the events, and that's been the biggest blessing is being able to, you know, have my wife be a stay home um, since he was born. Um, he, <clears throat> she's been a stay home, and we actually homeschool. Mm-hmm. And um, that's what and, I want to do. Yeah, homeschool. You want to homeschool, and uh, yeah, I mean, it, homeschooling is just a whole another topic. Topic, and we just absolutely love it. Just so much freedom, but um, I, I just appreciate you taking the time to to you know spend the time with us yeah. and sharing us uh, all the good insights. So appreciate you, and I'm sure we'll see you yeah, soon. Appreciate. Thank it. you. Thank you.